Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the discussion of corruption and the Lava Jato scandal in Latin America. A new book uh, published uh, and uh, co-edited by Paul Lagunas uh, in the uh, Portuguese edition, as well by Fernanda Odija and myself in a minor role as well. My name is Jan Sveinar. I'm professor at Columbia and director of the Center on Global Economic Governance. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers, who will be Professor Paul Lagunes, who is an associate professor at Columbia School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, he has done major uh, research in several areas, focusing on the political economy of development, in which he has explored a number of issues specializing and focusing on corruption, mainly through the execution of randomized controlled trials uh, in diverse contexts, such as Peru, Mexico, and New York. Paul Lagunes offers insights on the conditions under which anti-corruption monitoring is most effective. He has published a number of articles in a number of outlets. He uh, is co-editor with Susan Rose Ackerman of Greed, Corruption and the Modern State, Essays in Political Economy. He obtained his PhD from Yale University and it's been a great pleasure to collaborate with him at Columbia and in the Center on Global Economic Governance in particular. The second uh, presenter discussant uh, today will be Carla Ganla, who holds uh, a Master's of Public Administration degree from Columbia University, and in particular from the School of International Public Affairs, as well as a Master of Public Health degree from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. One of her areas of specialization is political and economic uh, development. She is also a healthcare systems and population health specialist and uh, she co-authors three chapters in the book that we're presenting to you today. Uh, please welcome with me the two uh, presenters and Paul and Carla, please take it from here. Thank you, Jan. Um, as Jan introduced, um, Paul and I will be presenting on the recently published volume, Corruption and the Lava Jato Scandal in Latin America. And we will focus on the concluding chapter to this volume, which is a summary of most of the main points of the volume. This will be our agenda for today. Starting first with background. Authorities began uncovering Lava Jato in March of 2014. Prosecutors in the Southern city of Curitiba were looking into the activities of black market money dealers. These dealers were using gas in car wash stations to launder money, which is how the scandal, or more precisely the operation that uncovered the scandal, got its name. As the authorities extended their search, they found that a particular dealer, Alberto Youssef, had links to Paulo Roberto Costa, a high-level executive of Brazil's state-owned oil company, Petrobras. Thus, what began as a local investigation into money laundering uncovered collusion between Petrobras employees and construction companies seeking contracts for public work projects. The oil company's employees took bribes, a portion of which they then shared with the politicians who had appointed them to their posts in Petrobras. Prosecutors found corrupt practices involving Odebrecht, the region's largest construction group, which covered a total of 12 countries. All told, the corruption scheme resulted in inflated costs for public works projects at the expense of taxpayers. Lama Jato is celebrated by many for disrupting the impunity long enjoyed by some of the world's political and economic elite. Lava Jato now shares a space alongside Manipulite as a corruption scandal of historic proportions. However, it is unclear whether Lava Jato will actually be remembered as a painful, if necessary, step in the path toward heightened government integrity. The question about Lava Jato's legacy is particularly relevant considering the amount of controversy that has surrounded the operation since it first came to light. Thus, we collaborated with a number of contributors, many of whom are Brazilian nationals, to produce 15 volume, a 15 volume chapter about Lava Jato. Our goal was to seek out knowledge that could help replace any sense of loss and frustration with a new sense of hope, purpose, and direction. 
One of the main takeaways from the volume might be what Jesse Bullock and Matthew Stevenson describe as the need to keep the Lava Jato spirit alive as the operation winds down. What they generally mean by this is the need to keep alive the belief that systemic corruption is not inevitable. Greater accountability is possible. The flood of successful corruption probes indicates that elements of Brazil's system account of accountability have been working. Between 2014 and early 2020, uh, Lava Jato saw nearly 1,000 people charged and over 200 convictions. In addition to this, two ex-presidents, one sitting senator, the former speaker of the lower house, as well as the former governor of Rio de Janeiro have been arrested. Before Lava Jato, a common discontent in Brazil was that corruption cases dragged on for years and few people faced actual punishment. Lava Jato has seemingly changed this. To echo one of the claims made by Delton Delaniel in an extended interview featured in this volume, the level of impunity in Brazil is no longer where it was before the beginning of the operation. Still, as Susan Rose Ackerman and Raquel de Matos Pimenta argue in their co-authored chapter, corruption control cannot depend solely on criminal prosecutions. Across Latin America, structural reforms are needed in order to achieve that which reactive measures cannot. Demonstrating that corruption will not go unpunished sends a credible message that can inhibit, inhibit future criminality. However, as long as there are strong institutional incentives that favor corruption, members of the law enforcement community can only do so much. As Rose Ackerman and DeMatteos Pimenta explain, Brazil's party fragmentation and public financing rules incentivize corruption. Similarly, Bullock and Stevenson describe how irregular funds known as Caja Dois have been well institutionalized despite being illegal. The authors of both chapters strongly agree that structural reforms and vigorous initiatives are needed. The reforms and initiatives highlighted at different points throughout this volume include the following. Limiting the ability of white collar defendants for whom the incriminating evidence is strong to obstruct justice. Requiring greater transparency from political parties, especially with regards to their finances. Preserving and disseminating the expertise gained by the Lava Jato Task Force. Increasing the authority, independence, and resource base of electoral monitoring institutions, prosecutors, and courts as well as improving coordination among the various institutions of accountability, including the Comptroller General, the Prosecutor General, the Federal Court of Accounts, the Public Prosecutor's Office, and the Federal Police. And lastly, defending the anti-corruption agenda from politicization. Adding to these recommendations, Rose Mac Ackerman and DeMatos Pimenta engaged some of their research on the Brazilian political system before suggesting that Brazil adopt political institutions that encourage the formation of stable coalitions. So in summary, the volume engages some of the ways forward in the post Lava Jato world. Another takeaway from the volume relates to media coverage of Lava Jato. Various contributors to the volume point out that reporting of Lava Jato was not perfect. While Beatrice Bula and Courtney Newell highlight the unprecedented role played by the media in keeping the public informed and holding officials accountable, some authors in the volume are concerned about evidence of possible failings on part of news organizations. In their chapter, Daniela Campello, Anya Schifrin, Karina Bellarmino, and Deborah Tome reflect on what they perceive as reporters' hasty reliance on leaked information, as well as potential bias against left-leaning politicians. Similarly, in chapter 12 of the volume, Glenn Greenwald, formerly of The Intercept, argues that media in Brazil failed to live up to the responsibility of reporting accurately and impartially on Lava Jato. To quote the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist whom Paul and I interviewed in this volume, uh, Glenn Greenwald says, I think the complex and probably more insidious flaw was so often that so much of the reporting consisted of receiving accusations unproven by any evidence and untested in court. The media's mistake was taking these accusations and trumpeting them in headlines. And so often those accusations never ended up in court because there was no evidence that would allow even an indictment, let alone a conviction. So you had huge numbers of people whose reputations were destroyed. 
or sullied at the very least, with no opportunity to defend themselves because of leaks from Lava Janto. In their chapter, Bola and Newell echo Greenwald's concern. However, Bola and Newell also highlight the ways in which various news outlets have recognized and tried to make up for their mistakes. For example, Folia and Veja partnered with The Intercept in reporting on information that prior to 2019 was not available. And this is information that as Paul and I highlight in the concluding chapter, raises some questions about the work of the prosecutors and the lead judge behind Lava Jato. Speaking of the volumes concluding chapter, that's where Carl and I examine the question of whether Lava Jato has stressed Brazil's democracy. The country was once, not that long ago, governed by a military dictatorship and is currently governed by a military veteran whose cabinet is populated by more current or former military officers than any pre previous civilian government. So as Carla and I see it, by exposing corruption in Brazil's democratic system, Lava Jato may have contributed to a chain of events that makes the threat, threat of authoritarianism greater today than it was before 2014. With this particular concern in mind, Ana Luisa Arana writes about the quote, Madisonian spirit. The Madisonian spirit is a guiding principle invoked decades earlier by Guillermo O'Donnell. It invites observers to question the democratic intentions of those claiming to promote accountability. Perhaps compatible with this general call for caution are the following recommendations, both, both of which are closely related. The first recommendation is that the members of a country's web of accountability, including prosecutors and judges, should avoid political bias and political meddling considering that a regime's judicial system rests on the principle of fairness. The second recommendation is that the members of a country's web of accountability should be extraordinarily careful in how they conduct themselves. This is especially true considering that their statements and actions, including the statements and actions that they make in private, could be scrutinized and eventually used to undermine their efforts, however noble these might be. Moving on to countries' differential responses to La Vajato, the volume pays special attention to Peru and Mexico. As a political scientist and an anti-corruption scholar, Denise Rodriguez Olivari details in her chapter how despite various obstacles, Peru's special prosecution team has made progress, particularly through the use of legal tools such as pretrial detention and plea agreements. Rodriguez's chapter helps make up for the scant attention that the international media has given to Peru's special prosecution team. However, to fully measure Peru's progress in the midst of Lava Jato, a point of comparison is needed, and Raquel de Matos Pimenta and Catherine Green provide that comparison. In their chapter, de Matos Pimenta and Green note that Odebrecht, the company at the center of the corruption scandal, had greater market share and therefore political power in Peru as compared with Mexico. De Matos Pimenta and Green also note that the legal framework favoring corruption control seems stronger in Mexico than in Peru. So which of the two country has, countries has made greater progress in response to Lava Jato? Against what could have been predicted thus far, the answer is Peru. Again, as of this writing, investigations in Mexico have had limited results. Meanwhile, in Peru, high profile individuals are facing pretrial detentions and the country's authorities have reached a settlement with Odebrecht and there have been efforts to pass legal reforms that are relevant to the case. In his chapter, Connor Warman broadens the comparison that cross -country with cross-country cross statistical analyses. Warman compares the Latin American countries in which Odebrecht invested and which were subsequently implicated in Lava Jato with other regional countries in, with, in which Odebrecht had no investment. What drives this analysis is the possibility that Odebrecht may have chosen countries in which to conduct business based on their government's corruptibility. In the end, Warman finds some evidence that Odebrecht favored countries that were more permeable to bribes. Another chapter in the volume that is centered around the analysis of data is the one I co-authored with Marcia Sanzovo. Marcia and I examine the lack of accountability surrounding urban improvement projects undertaken in preparation for the 2016 Rio Olympic Games. We examine $9.3 billion that were initially budgeted for infrastructure development. Going project by project, we attempt to determine whether the government delivered on what was promised. Marcia and I find that access to high quality transportation improved and that transit speed on some of Rio's main roadways increased. At the same time, however, we notice a lack of publicly available information about the relevant infrastructure investments and the fact that less than half of these projects have been fully completed at the time of writing. 
Marcia and I are also careful to report on allegations of bribery and overbilling surrounding the 2016 Rio Olympics. Lava Jato is a vast research subject that 15 chapters contained in this volume cannot fully encompass. There are additional topics that are especially deserving of future scholarly attention. Uh, for instance, organized civil society has played a non-trivial role in supporting the Lava Jato investigations in a number of countries, including Brazil and Peru. These civil society organizations, or CSOs, can play an important role in defending prosecutors against efforts to curtail their independence. CSOs can also push for adoption of new and well-calibrated anti-corruption policies. And so the actual and potential contributions of CSOs definitely merit closer analysis. In a similar vein, the contribution of international actors also deserves a closer look. For example, it would be worth understanding the extent to which authorities from countries with arguably more robust institutions played in advising Brazilian authorities involved in Lava Jato. Additionally, an apolitical study dedicated to understanding the supposed role of Lula and Lava Jato could help bring clarity to an especially sensitive subject. In as many years as a crucial leader of the Brazilian left, Lula frequently spoke out against corruption. Then in 2005, three years into his two-term presidency, the Workers' Party that he formed in the early 1980s was caught in the Mensalao scandal. As is discussed in the chapter that Professor Albert Fishlow authored for the volume, politicians close to Lula are found guilty of corruption in the Mansalao case. Lula himself has faced allegations of corruption for bribes received as part of Lava Jato. And so in the face of these allegations, there are people who are convinced that Lula is innocent as well as those who are convinced of the opposite. Thus, a detailed and objective analysis and the available evidence about this case seems worthwhile. Then there is also the issue of the rise of Jair Bolsonaro. In 2018, a few months before the Brazilian presidential elections, candidate Bolsonaro offered a bold message on corruption control. He promised his fellow citizens a different kind of government, an honest government. However, it is worth cautioning that anti-corruption as a rhetorical device has been a near permanent feature of the Brazilian political landscape for decades. Across Latin America, there's a history of politicians being elected into office but then failing to fulfill their campaign promises. Thus, we join those who warn about the importance of validating Bolsonaro's words against his actual behavior. In this spirit, in a co-authored study, Greg Michener, Fernando Dija, Breno Pires, and I seek to answer the following question. Is Jair Bolsonaro delivering on his central campaign promise to fight corruption? But that's a separate question for another project. As to the volume that I quoted it with Jan, with which benefited tremendously from Carla's intellectual insights and diligent effort, and which is being translated to Portuguese and is being quoted, the Portuguese language version is being quoted with Fernando Dia. Our aim has been to contribute to the ongoing debate about Lava Jato. This is not the last word on the subject, but we do think it's a contribution to our understanding of a very complex issue. Thank you very much.